We're in the middle of a sermon series right now, and it's the series of David. King David, David, a man after God's own heart. And today I'm really excited about preaching on David. Last week I preached on David and his mighty men. How David and his mighty men, how they faced giants and how they defeated those giants. The story last week, David was an older man with his mighty men and they defeated four giants. Those giants, each of them represent something in your life that God has called you to defeat. I talked about the giant of weariness, the giant of distractions, the giant of revisiting, the giant of perversion. I wanna tell you this, God has called you to face those giants and God has called you to win. That was later in David's life when he was a little bit older. But today I wanna back up and I wanna talk about when David was just a boy and this is the first giant that David ever faced. One of the most famous stories in the Bible or in the world today, David and Goliath. And today I wanna tell you the title of my message is defeating your Goliath. You know that big thing that is facing you that you think is impossible? God has called you to stand firm, to face it, and for you to have victory in the name of Jesus, I declare that you will defeat your giant. Come on, let's bow our heads and let's pray. God, we love you, we praise your name. Bless us today. I pray your word will speak through me. And God, bless Shreveport Community Church and everyone in this place. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, hey, give someone a high five and you can go ahead and be seated. I knew there was gonna be some extra anointing today because how about them tigers? Come on, somebody, huh? In Jesus' name, we're gonna defeat that giant, those Florida Gators, and we will be champions today. Thank you, Jesus, come on. I wanna give a, just a, a bug in your ear before I get started, and that is next week and the next week, uh, my dad, the next two weeks, he will be preaching on David. We're gonna continue this series. And I just wanna tell you this, my dad's teaching on David and his personal devotions with me growing up, and then from this stage, his perception and his teaching on David is totally life-changing and transformative. Make sure you do everything you can to be here the next two weeks. It's gonna be marvelous. But today, we're talking about David and Goliath. Really quickly, I just wanna give you the story of David and Goliath. This is probably one of my kids' favorite bedtime stories. And it goes like this. You have the Philistines on top of this mountain. They're the bad guys, right? And then you have the Israelites on top of this mountain, and they're facing each other. In between them is a valley. In the valley, there's a big giant. His name's Goliath. Goliath is taunting God's people. Goliath said, send your best guy to face me. If he beats me, then we will be your slaves. But if I beat him, you will be our slaves. Well, God's people were terrified of this giant. No one would fight him. David was 16 years old, and his father told him to bring food to his brothers at the army camp. So he gets there, and when he gets there, he hears this giant taunting the children of Israel. And he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine mocking our God? And they said, well, David, King Saul said there's a big reward for anyone that kills that giant. David goes immediately to King Saul, who's the king of Israel, says, King Saul, I've killed lions, I've killed bears. This giant will be nothing for me. Let me take him out. Somehow, King Saul said, go ahead. But King Saul gave him some armor. David said, armor is not gonna work. I don't fight that way. I gotta fight the way that I fight. So he went and chose five smooth stones for his little slingshot. And he went towards that giant. You know the story. He slung that rock, hit him between the eyes. That giant fell. He cut his head off and held it up 
for the greatest victory in history. And today, I'm telling you, God has called you to have a great victory, no matter what you're facing. So I just wanna step back and now go through the story a little slower and give you some truths of how you can defeat your giant. The first truth is this. David, he saw the reward. Okay, David saw the reward. The Bible, it says this in 1 Samuel 17 and 25. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? The giant comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from royal taxes and give him the royal robe to wear. So David hears it. Okay, that's one time. And then he goes to another person and David says, hey, won't you tell me one more time what that reward is? What, what's that reward? Well, you're gonna get to marry the king's daughter, royal threads, and no taxes. Hmm. He goes to another person. Hey, one more time. Would you tell me what the reward is for killing this giant? Well, you get to marry the king's daughter. Royal robes, no taxes. And this is what I want you to see. It was as if David had his eyes on the prize. Three times he wanted to hear what that reward was because in his eyes, he was holding the trophy already. He saw the king's daughter and he said, that is my wife, that is my lady. And I want you to hear this today. There's a lot of Christians that think it's holy. They think it's righteous and godly not to want anything. If you ask them, What would you like God to give you? They say, well, God is just enough for me. God is everything I need, and that's true. He is our exceeding and great reward, but yet the Bible is full of things that God wants you to have. And I know you feel sometimes, you might feel a little funny, a little awkward asking for the promises of God, especially if they haven't come to pass yet. But listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says, which of you If your son asks for bread, we'll give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Your father will answer all of your prayers. And don't put the fact that you don't have the right job You don't have the right circumstance or situation. No, God says this. You have not because you ask not. Ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. The Bible said it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom of almighty God. David, being a good Jewish boy, He understood rewards as it related to his God. God gave a land to his people, a land of milk and honey. He gave them homes to live in they did not build. He gave them vineyards they did not plant. David believed that the wealth of the wicked was stored up for the righteous, and he had no apprehension whatsoever, no hesitation to go after the reward. I can hear him now, he's probably saying, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? All I have to do is kill that big, hairy, gnarly giant, and I get all of these rewards? Where do I sign up? And he couldn't wait to get out in the midst of his battle in front of his giant. You know, I don't know what it is about the modern church, especially in America. It's as if we have so much that we no longer get excited about the exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think with Almighty God. Look and listen to me this morning. I want you to hear this. You're not godly for telling God you don't want anything, especially the things that he's determined to give you. In fact, they should be so important to you that you're willing to fight a giant to get them. You know, in my life, I remember praying in great detail for many things, but I prayed that God would bring me a wife. I prayed that God would bring me a woman that would be an incredible 
lover of God, that she was so great in the church that she would inspire me to love God more. I remember praying that God would bring me a smoking hot wife. I remember praying that. I remember praying that God would bring me somebody that would be an amazing mom, a great wife that would be hilarious, that we would have fun with. We would have so much, so many great times. She'd be my best friend. And God brought me Sarah, exceeding abundantly above what I could have ever asked or thought. As the good old boy said, I far out punted my coverage. I'm telling you, God gave me more than I could ever experience. And here's what it is, over and over again in my life, I've asked God for exact things, very particular, and every single time, God doesn't do what I ask, but he answers the prayer exceeding abundantly above in great detail. And I'm telling you today, get your eyes on the reward. Get your eyes on the prize. Get your eyes on the dream that God has given you and face that giant. How many of you want the reward of Almighty God in this place? If you want it, put your hands together for the reward. Come on. <laughs> David could face that giant because he understood the power that was inside of him. Okay, David was not confident that he was gonna kill that giant because he was a great warrior or marksman. David was confident because he had already felt the power of God come upon him in the greatest battles of life. I can hear David, 16 year old boy, going to King Saul, presenting his case, so King Saul would allow him to go face this giant. It probably sounded like this. King Saul, listen, I know this sounds like a fabrication, an exaggeration, a prevarication, if you will, but I'm telling you the truth, King Saul. A lion, it came out against my flock. I wanted to run, but suddenly there was this strange power that I knew was from Almighty God, and it came upon me. I've never felt anything like this, King Saul. I literally threw down my staff, and I took that line with my bare hands, and I killed it. Another day, I hear a roar in the midst of my flock, and I look, and it's a bear. And the same power that came on me then came on me once again. I ran at that bear. That bear stood its ground, but oh, it should have run, because with my own hands, I killed the bear once again. And I can tell you this, that giant, it's, it's no lion, it's no bear, but that same power that came upon me then will come upon me once again when I run towards that giant. God is gonna give me the victory. Let me fight this giant. And that's what you gotta say in your life. You gotta see it, and you gotta run towards that giant. The power of God is inside of you. You know, the story, I think we miss it because the story is all about David being this great warrior so many times. We hear on ESPN, the small school beat the big school. It was a David and Goliath victory. David's this great warrior, but that's not the point of the story. And I want you to hear me clearly. It's the testimony of David being connected to and empowered by Almighty God. That's the point of the story. This is a story about the power of God on a yielded vessel. Okay, God working through a yielded vessel. Go and look at the declarations of David, his declarations of war throughout the Bible and how he gives credit to Almighty God in everything. I would encourage you this, write this down, say them every single day, declare them over your lives. But these are David's declarations of war. David learned this, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. It was David who said, for by God I have run through a troop, and by God I have left over a wall. It was David that said, God makes my hands ready for war. And David understood, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him. Oh friend, it's not you. You're not the point of the story. David's not the point of the story, but the power of God flowing through a yielded vessel. And then anything is possible. One thing we miss is probably the biggest miracle 
or one of the biggest miracles in this story, it's King Saul. King Saul was head and shoulders above the rest, the Bible said. King Saul was a seasoned and proven warrior. But somehow King Saul allowed a 16-year-old boy to go out and fight Goliath with the entire nation on the line. I want you to see this, and I've, I've never thought of it this way, but probably the thing we don't stop and realize is this was not just David's Goliath. It was also Saul's Goliath. Saul had a Goliath as well and let him just pass by. Think about it. Didn't Saul have the same anointing and access to the power of God to step in and to be able to slay that? Absolutely he did. Did David access something that Saul did not have? Absolutely not. The difference was David had the faith to seize the moment, and once it dawned on David, I believe everything in his spirit, it shouted, that's my giant, that's my fight, this is my moment, and he stepped up. You know, some of you in this place, some of you have run away from the giant that was the key to your promotion and the key to your favor and your breakthrough. I don't know how many times I hear believers say, oh, I'm just so overwhelmed. Even things of God, I'm just so overwhelmed. I'm in a tough time. Uh, this past week, Alex, who is over our um, worship, can we put our hands together for Alex right now? We've been in the middle of finishing SC Worship album, and I wanna tell you today, I got some great news. We have finished the album. Can I hear a thank you, Jesus? Come on. This past week. This is my prayer. I pray that as we release these songs in the coming weeks, that these songs will be declarations to the giants in your life of victory, and these will be our summer songs. We had some summer tunes. Are you kidding me? And we have people singing on it on our team, 12 years old, all the way to people in their 70s. It's every generation. So what's been happening these last few weeks, Alex has been mixing, producing, pulling long hours, and we've been in the studio and just working his tail off to finish. It's been glorious. But I was talking to Alex, and Alex said something that was so powerful and so telling, and we need to hear it. I want you to get this. Let it sink into your spirit. This is what he said in his transparency and his honesty. He said, you know, all the stuff that's overwhelming me is everything I ask God for. Everything that's overwhelming me, it's all the things that I prayed God would give me. Here's the fact, ladies and gentlemen. If you really experience a breakthrough in any area of your life, it's gonna be because God sent you a giant. Yes, there was a beautiful princess and there was royal threads and he'd never have to pay taxes again, but he still, before he got any of it, he had to stand and face that giant and conquer that giant. You know, I think so many of us get the verse wrong that says, if God be for us, who can be against us? That verse is not saying that God's gonna fight all your battles for you. That verse is saying that God wants to fight with you in the battles of life. It is possible that as we read this story, that Saul... He was overwhelmed, so King Saul didn't want to step out there, so Saul hears this testimony from David, and he says, okay, David, I'm going to let you fight the giant, but I want you to use my armor. It's possible that Saul wanted him to go out in the battle with his armor, because maybe David would conquer the giant, and somehow Saul would take credit for the victory, but David was very respectful. David said, Saul, listen, I haven't proven myself in this armor. I don't fight that way. I can't wear it. I, I gotta fight my way. Yeah. So he went out and he chose five smooth stones for his slingshot, and he prepared to fight the way that God had called him to fight. And fighting your giants, he gives us a timeless lesson of how we fight the giants in our life. And I want you to hear this this morning. 
Always remember to wear your own armor. Always remember to wear your own armor. If I'm honest and very transparent myself this morning, when God put his hand on me to follow two generations of pastors here at Shreveport Community Church and to preach the gospel as one more in a family of world-renowned preachers, let me tell you, I had to make some decisions about how I was gonna go into battle. My style would not be the style of my grandfather. My grandfather stood on this stage. It was as if the rafters of heaven shook and the power of God was released every time he spoke. It would not be the style of my dad. I've never experienced anything like my dad. When he speaks, it's as if God is transferring and dictating directly through my dad and the power of God is so thick. It would not be the power and the same style as my sisters that travel the world or my brother-in-laws or my mom or my Grammy. Let me tell you this, it wouldn't be the style of my wife. I've got to wear my own armor. Do you have any idea how intimidating it is to be a preacher in this family? <laughs> but I can't wear anybody else's armor. Friends, I, I've, I've gotta be me. I'm the downline of the same anointing and have no pressure to be my grandfather, to be my father. God has called me to wear my own armor, to be exactly who I am. And it would be easy to take their style, their methodology, but God hasn't called me to be that, and God hasn't called you to do that. Let me tell you, God is not calling you to be your daddy. God's not calling you to be your mom, to be that person that you look up to. God is calling you to be you and to wear your own armor and to fight the way that God has empowered you to fight. This is one of the biggest things that we face as men and women of God in humanity. It's tough and people say, I could never do it that way. Friend, God's not calling you to do it that way. Say, man, I just, I'm not that smart. I don't have this or that. I can't do these things. Listen to me. God will empower what you have if you give him what you've got even if it's just a slingshot. Come on, give God some praise today. Come on. So now the time has come. The giant from Gath standing on the battlefield and he is mocking God and mocking God's people. He's saying, I'm gonna kill your warrior and I'm gonna take you and change everything about your life. I'm taking your kids. I'm taking your community. I'm gonna destroy you. This reminds me a lot of the giant of culture that the church of Jesus Christ is facing today. Some of you are concerned about that taunting giant and all you can hear is, hey, we're gonna take your children. We're gonna take your jobs. We're gonna take your churches, your rights. We're gonna take your lives. Here's what I want you to understand, friends, that right now in our country, in our world, maybe the only voice that you hear is the taunting giant from Gath of culture. But if you take your eyes off that giant just for a moment, and if you look a few hundred yards away, you're gonna see a little shepherd boy. And that shepherd boy is running with everything in his might. He looks out of place. He looks like he should not be there. Don't let his appearance fool you because when he gets his hand on that giant, he's gonna crush and cut the head off that giant. I wanna tell you this. I've read this book from cover to cover and I know how this story ends. And the fact is, that any giant that comes against the David Church of Jesus Christ is gonna be defeated. Yeah, you're gonna be on the battlefield, you're gonna be bloody, you're gonna be muddy, but we will be victorious. The Church of Jesus Christ will be victorious. Come on, give God some praise right now. We're gonna win, come on. So this brings us to the moment. I want you to go to this moment, okay? 
This is the biggest event. I want you to see it. The Philistines on the mountain. You got the Israelites. And then the battlefield is the valley right in the middle. And here comes David. Can you imagine what this moment must have been like? I mean, to have been there. Okay, we've, we've all seen Tommy Tanks hit a walk-off bomb to go to the finals. We've seen Cade Beloso in the 11th hit a bomb to go to the championship game. We've seen the touchdowns thrown for Super Bowls, home runs hit for World Series, 100-meter world records broken. And here's the thing that I love, and it's funny to me. The people that claim to have been at these events, they outnumber the available seats by the tens of thousands. I was there. I saw the catch. I saw the hit. I saw it. Can you imagine what it must have been like to see that shepherd boy, to be in that stadium as he goes to fight the eight foot five killing machine? Everybody there heard what Goliath said. Goliath said, am I a dog? He's taunting David. That you would come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. But then it all happens in such a lightning speed. I feel like there was just silence that swept across that entire valley as David ran towards that giant and he slung the stone and he hit that giant right between the eyes. They were probably watching from a long ways off and can you imagine him whispering to each other? Did, did he hit him? I think he, no, he missed him. Wait, did, did he hit him? And all of a sudden Goliath is swaying like a big tree and tower and the giant is down, and with lightning speed, David jumps on him, cuts the giant's head off, holds it up to the Philistines, and he says, remember our deal. <laughs> You're our slaves now. And the Philistines, they were saying, Goliath sure did have a big mouth. We don't want to be anyone's slaves. And they turned and they ran with everything in their hearts. And as they were running, what were they thinking? They were probably thinking, goodness gracious, if they just sent a little shepherd boy out to fight our greatest warrior, what do their warriors fight like? Their little shepherd boy just killed Goliath. And they run. And let me tell you this. They ran and they ran so far, they chased them that day for 27 miles, 27 miles they chased them. And it was a victory that reverberated for generation after generation for the Israelites and their families. Listen to me, mom and dad. Whenever you defeat the giants in your life, it's not just for you, but it's for your children. When you defeat the giants in your life, it will reverberate for generations. It's not just for you, but it's about everyone around you also being able to chase their demons and to win their victories. And you will have the victory in Jesus' name. I want the worship team to come up right now. Here's what you have to understand is that there's so many giants in our life and there's so many people that leave the church because the church wounded them, okay? Church hurt is a massive big giant and I've watched it my entire life. People get hurt, they get wounded, offended by the church and they decide to walk away from the battle. They allow the giant of their offense to really back them down. Okay, a lot of you know the story of the Duran side of my family, but a lot of you don't know the story of my mom's side of the family. I just wanna tell you right now, Dionza Duran, she's the biggest giant slayer that I've ever seen in my life. Five foot two, little feisty Italian, she slays giants all day long. She has gargantuous faith. She has the power of Almighty God and she understands when that giant comes, 
She doesn't back down, but she stands in his face and she slays giants. I love watching her live life. You know, my mom was a preacher's kid as well. Some of you don't know that. But her father, Gerald Pletcher in the 1950s, he planted churches all over New Mexico and Arizona, and he ended up pastoring in Milan, Tennessee. Now in the 50s, there were very few churches with over 500 congregation members, but my grandfather in the 1950s had a congregation of 500 attenders. It was a big deal in his, in his little town, and it was a miracle. You've heard the story. I mean, you've heard the phrase, I wanna die in the pulpit. But when that is realized, it's not something that you ever want to happen because that's exactly what happened to my grandfather. Uh, when my mom was three years old, on my grandfather's 42nd birthday, as he stood in the pulpit of his local church, he had a brain aneurysm and he died. Her good father, her safe father was was taken from her. He left a widow and three children. My mom, she was three years old. Can I tell you that congregation of 500 people did not take care of my grandmother? My grandmother was 33 years old, three children, and the church that she loved so well, that she led so well in her greatest time of need, they turned their back on her. You know, my grandfather had a dream that he would have a thousand members in his congregation. And the day of his funeral, all the flags in the city, they, they were at half mass and, and the people that came out, his dream became a reality, but he wasn't able to see it with physical eyes, but he saw it from the banisters of heaven as over a thousand people came to honor him at his funeral. But do you know as they prepared that funeral, the church didn't even prepare the funds to take care of it for my grandmother. They threw everything to her and they turned their back on her. Let me tell you this, it was scary for a widow at 33. She didn't know how she was gonna provide for her family. So she completed a course and got a mail-in certificate to teach music. She put it on her wall and began teaching music night and day just to provide food for the family. Let me tell you this, if anyone had a reason to turn their back on the church, it was my grandmother. If anyone had a reason to grow up disillusioned, not liking the church, running from the church, it was my mother. But she refused to go there. She was gonna face that giant. She was determined she would not back down and she would never leave the church of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, my mom has spent her entire life loving the church. She's been leading the church, serving the church, believing in the church and speaking life over the church. Even as a five-year-old, my mom's told me stories of her being in the church because my grandmother, Nana, refused to leave the church. My mom was five years old. She told me of times she would be down at the altar and felt the presence of God so strongly calling her to ministry. And in her 20s, when she was single, she joined a group. And she began traveling the entire world singing and preaching the gospel. She's told me stories of singing at the, at the Great Wall, going to all these different countries. And she told me one story in particular. She was, she was in India, and she was at this outdoor rally. There was tens of thousands of people in India. She's standing on the stage, she's singing, but all of a sudden, this radical group of Hindus determined they were gonna attack the meeting and they did violently. And all of a sudden, the lights of the whole place, they went out, it was pitch black. An entire seating section, it collapsed and they took rocks and they started throwing rocks at the stage. 
But the power of Almighty God came on my mom and she didn't retreat. She didn't run, but she stood in the dark as rocks whispered by her face and she sang these words. She said, no one has ever cared for me like Jesus. No one has ever cared for me like Jesus. It was a statement to the giant. Not only have you not caused me to leave the church of Jesus Christ, but you're defeated, giant. I will spend my whole life and my children will spend their whole lives serving the church of Jesus Christ. I'm facing you. I'm not backing down. The power is strong that's in me and you are defeated. Come on, get on your feet this morning and give God some praise. Come on, get on your feet this morning and give God some praise if you love him. That's what God wants to do for you. God wants to empower you. I'm closing right now and we're going to sing this song and you're going to declare over your giants that you have victory. God wants you to have victory. So looking back on the story of David, what was the secret of David's victory? Okay, one thing it, it could have been, it was definitely that David prepared in the secret place. So right now you may feel like you're isolated. You may feel alone, marginalized. But I can tell you this, if you don't give up in your alone times, even in the times when you feel forgotten, God is preparing you to fight and face and defeat the greatest giant in your life. So another reason that he had victory is that everyone doubted him, but he trusted the word of his testimony. And in the word of his testimony, he said, I got a testimony. I've been in battles. I've written songs. I've felt the power of Almighty God. Never doubt the power of God in your spirit. But you say, Denny, if there is one thing and one thing only, what is it? The one thing I feel is that David understood the power of the name of Almighty God. Yeah. David understood the power of the name yeah. of Almighty God. He looked at that giant. He ran towards that giant. He said, you come against me with sword and spear, yeah. but I come against you in the name of my God. Yeah. In the name yeah. you are defeated. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please, please don't ever forget the power of the name of Jesus. Don't ever forget that God said, whatever you ask in my name, I shall give it to you. Don't ever forget the end of the story, and that is that you have victory. Today, I want you to lift your hands with me, and we're gonna sing this song. And as we sing, I want you to see your victory, and I want you to confess the name of Jesus. Come on, let's sing this. That's your victory, come on. I'm gonna see you. Confess it today to your giants. This is your moment. To you, Lord. Don't miss your moment. Come on, put your I'm hands up. Let's worship God right now. It's not about I'm anything else. It's about you and God right now. Come on, see your victory. Thank you, Jesus. To you, Lord. Your giants are going to fall today. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle. For the battle. Turn it for good. You turn it for good. Everybody see it, see it. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Turn it for good. Oh, you take what the enemy, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Let's declare this together. And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna.
the sea of victory. Yes. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Hallelujah. I'm gonna see a victory. 